Good morning, everybody. We're so excited that you could join us. We just want to encourage you with a time of worship, and we just want to ask that you would join in um, with us as we just press into the presence of the Lord this morning. Um, and I just want to pray for us as we just enter in. And we just shake off all our, uh, just the whole week. And we just shake off anything that's on us, Lord. We just ask that your spirit would come right now and fill us. God, that you would just fill us to overflowing. God, that you would fill our, our houses. God, you would fill our rooms. God, that you would fill our minds, God, with, our, with your spirit, God. God, we just welcome you in this morning. God, we just ask that your spirit would come, God, and bring comfort, God, in this time of chaos. God, that you would be the, the comfort that we need, Lord.
Just so excited to have uh, you here today and uh, excited to have you invited you into my home, into Chris and my home. And obviously it's a very uh, unique experience here doing this by video, but I trust we're going to be able to really release and impart the, what the Lord has for us. And uh, we have um, just maybe a few announcements. Um, one is just everybody's been really honestly so faithful in their giving and their, in their tithing. And so it's been a huge blessing as we've gone through this season of testing and, and a trial that uh, people have just been really faithful in their giving. So we encourage you to continue to do so. You can do it online at our Zion Spokane website. And there's a, a, a link to click there to, to give and you continue to do that. Or you can send it in uh, by mail to Zion Spokane, PO Box 7337, Spokane, Washington 99207. And uh, we'll just uh, continue to be blessed through this season that we're through, that we're walking through and continue to uh, do so. All right. Well, again, I'm excited to uh, have you into my home. 
and uh, excited just to be able to release what the Lord's given me. It's always been a really, really long time since I have had a chance to share with you. It's actually at the end of January was the last time I preached. And for those of you who are new, I'm just going to give a really quick recap. I know Chris has been updating you about my health and all that's kind of going through, but just wanted to give a really quick update for me for those who are watching for the first time or those, I don't know, there may be some confusion. How's John doing? <laughs> and then you're looking at my hair, my lack of hair, my uh, new hairstyle, which actually is a very, very expensive hairstyle. It's a very hair, expensive haircut. It's a like chemo, chemo special. And uh, <laughs> kind of once you go through that, then you end up kind of losing uh, your hair. But uh, so anyway, at the end of January, I was diagnosed uh, with acute uh, leukemia. And uh, the oncologist that I talked to at that point said, John, if you don't get treatment, you're going to be dead within a few weeks. So it was kind of an easy decision at that point. I'm like, OK, I need treatment. And the treatment is, as some of you may be familiar, familiar with, it's just a series of chemo treatments. And I was in the hospital for a month, kind of to the end of February. and really in through those series of treatments after three weeks of my initial diagnosis uh, they did a bone marrow biopsy and the doctor oncologist came back and said you're completely le leukemia free you're in complete remission there's no signs of cancer or leukemia in my blood and so that really has been the last medical um, pronouncement which we were just incredibly excited about just super thrilled with that it was the best possible thing that we could have had and I know people were so uh, just incredibly faithful to pray, to stand with us, to be with us through all that season. And I go, and I had a, a short uh, little bit I, at some point after I came out of the hospital to thank you. But really, again, just thanking everybody so much for your prayers, for your support, the texts, the messages, the stuff on uh, We Love John Son uh, Facebook page, and just in tremendous encouragement and love. And so I just I felt very supported, loved, carried, uh, I've received tons of just healing and encouragement through this season. And, and uh, I've shared a lot with people in the hospital and the doctor and just uh, I'm really overwhelmingly blessed by the level of support and love that I've had from family and friends and to church. And, and so just super, super excited. And so then it gets a little confusing uh, through this process. They basically, you kind of go through your initial uh, chemo treatment and then they have a series of four treatments we're actually going to the hospital on a Monday and I have treatments on Monday, Wednesday, Friday, and then I come out on Saturday morning. And really from, and, and what that is, is basically there's a, there's a, you know, historically there's a chance that the leukemia wants to come back. And so they just basically keep flushing your system and kind of keep coming at it with this uh, chemo. And so it's just, it's a precautionary, it's kind of standard treatment. And really I'm not, <laughs> I'm not, I'm not, um, Fighting, really at this point, I've had tons and tons of blood work. All the blood stuff comes back great. There's no signs of any kind of disease. But I'm fighting just the, the effects of the chemo. It's obviously is extremely strong. It's there to basically kill still and destroy everything. It just takes the good and it takes the bad. And that's kind of the best that we can do at this point. And so, but I really felt like from the Lord that that was, the, that I, that was what I was supposed to walk through. It wasn't obviously what I wanted to do, but I just felt like the Lord said, no, you need to walk through this whole process and so we're going to go through that series of four. I've been, I just finished a second uh, session, kind of a week-long session last Saturday. I'll have a three-week break, then I'll have another a third one, then I'll have another three-week break, then I'll have a fourth one. Then after that, we'll probably just be on maintenance and just uh, going in for blood work and checking. But so far, honestly, everything's looked great. And really, I felt really, really good. Other than the chemo kind of wipes me out physically, my strength. Each time, it kind of makes me real... Uh, weak, it attacks your nervous system, and, and sometimes my brain gets a little, I gotta, gotta fight through, okay, now what am I supposed to be doing? And uh, so there's a little bit of that, but honestly, your, your prayers, just for physical strength, um, and obviously, uh, I'll get into this, uh, I've told so, several people really the effects of what we're all going through in terms of this coronavirus, for me, has been more, has been more difficult, it's been harder uh, going through that than going through the chemo, and uh, just because physically, I've just I felt really good. I've been able to go out and walk and exercise and do lots of great stuff. And so I miss people, though. I miss all of you. I miss not hugging people. I miss not talking to people. And, uh, and just that, the social isolation part, I, <laughs> I'm not doing great. Honestly, some days I'm not doing well. Poor Chris, you can pray for her because as soon as I get a little, I get bristly, not a little bristly, I get bristly. 
and I'm not <laughs> exemplifying the character of Christ. And so I felt just that, uh, that effects of that, and, and we're all, you're all feeling that. I know when uh, somebody like Chris Knowlton tells me he really wants to get to, he wants to be around people, like it, it's affecting everybody. <laughs> it's taking everybody in. And, and, uh, and so hopefully we're gonna be, you know, we're getting close to the end and we're gonna have a time here soon that we can all get together. And I know we're kind of anxiously waiting for that, but I just super appreciate all the, again, all the prayers and support. And so I wanted, I wanna take you though to, again, I haven't had a chance to share in so long, but I wanna share a personal encounter that I had in the hospital with the Lord that was extremely powerful. And uh, I wanna to go to Zephaniah chapter three, verse 17. And when I entered kind of into this whole um, time here, going through these treatments, uh, I really uh, felt like, okay, you medical guys, you do what you do, you put the drugs and I'll take the pills and I'll do whatever. But really, I was really focused, really, I'm, I'm always pretty focused intensely on my relationship with the Lord. But it, <laughs> when you're facing life and death, it kicks it up to a whole nother level. And so really that first month I was in the hospital, it was just very much, you know, uh, just so, a lot of times when the nurses are in or people are in talking, what are there, but there's a lot of time, maybe even in the middle of the night where you're just awake and uh, you're just, you know, just really turning to the Lord and just, and, and he began to talk to me really from the start. Uh, Psalm, Psalm 91 was an early Psalm I latched on to. I'm gonna talk about the Exodus and the whole area of covenant was a, a big thing he was talking to me about, just the covenant, the blood, and the power of covenant in that. But I just was spending a lot of time just really kind of connected to the Lord. And so one night, I think it was maybe my second weekend, um, I can still, still feel it. Um, I was laying there in my bed, maybe around nine o'clock, and I think that the nurse had gone maybe around eight or so. And I just was, had, uh, you know, turning my heart to the Lord. And, and Chris, honestly, Chris had had a word that she shared early on. The first night I was in the hospital, she came home and she was laying in bed and she said she kind of, she felt her mind kind of wanting to spin out into, you know, all these millions of different scenarios that you can kind of start to imagine. And she just said, no. And she began to just, I'm not going there and begin to focus on the Lord. And the Lord spoke to her and said, I'm, I'm going to break every chain. And so for her, that was the word of the Lord and, and really gave her tremendous peace through this whole process. And for me, even that the fact that the Lord said, I'm going to break every chain speaks to freedom that we're being set free from a lot of chains that we've been, been walking in. And, and so I really held on to Chris's word and <laughs> I was probably like 90%, somewhere in the 90 percentile, like my faith. But then there was still like, okay, Lord, you know, I, I, am I gonna make through this? And I, I honestly, I feel like, you know, I'm going to. I just feel like, honestly, I feel like there's a, a, a lot of, a life, of life left in me. I'm thinking 30, 40 years of good life left in me. And so I just wasn't gonna, I wasn't gonna give in and so, Anyway, so I was just very, you know, again, focused on the Lord. So I'm laying there in my bed and, and thinking of the Lord. And all of a sudden, the Lord, um, he comes in. And uh, it's like this, this verse out of Zephaniah 317. I'll, I'll, I'll read the verse and I'll kind of go back to it. It says, the Lord your God is in your midst, a mighty, uh, a mighty one who, who will say, he will rejoice over you with gladness. He will quiet you by his love. And I was laying there, and it's like the Lord was above me, and he was, some of you have seen artists, and they, sometimes they paint this picture of Jesus, and they have like this super, like almost crazy happy expression on his face, like he's just smiling, like just ear to ear, I mean, just intensely, just, just smiling, and that, and, I, and he was there, he was like above my, but it wasn't like he was just above my bedroom, he was above my bed, he was like above all of the circumstances that I was going through at that point. And, and I just felt this incredible delight, incredible. Like I've never just, like when we experience the love of the Lord, it just comes in layers. We just get this progressive revelation on hopefully experiences with the Lord where we just all of a sudden go deeper and understand how much he loves us, how much he cares about us, how much he just, he just is so delighted and just is rejoicing. And so the Lord is above my bed and he's up, up, up you know, up, up, you know, I don't know, above my bed and, and, and uh, just knowing he's above all my circumstances. And he's just talking to me about how much he loves me and how he delights in me. And just, he's singing, he says, at first is he's singing over me with joy. 
And I'm just like, oh my gosh, it just, it's, I, I realized I was living this verse. I was, in, I, was, I was walking this in this verse. I was experiencing this verse. And, and so that was probably, and kind of for me, once you kind of get into an encounter with the Lord, I just, I just like writing a wave. I'm just, I'm going to write it out. And I wasn't in a hurry. To, I was just basically, it was such an incredible experience with the Lord touching me. I, and I just was receiving so much. I just let the Lord continue that. And probably after an hour, maybe more than, it went off for maybe more than an hour. Then all of a sudden, um, I felt this, like almost like there was from the Lord, there's almost like these streams of healing that began to flow down from him. And I, and all this, and I could just feel it coming into my body. And all of a sudden, my body got, I told Chris, I felt like I was having hot flashes. My body just got incredibly hot and I threw off my blankets and, at one point, I kind of sat on the side of the bed. And I was just this, just this heat was just radiating inside of me, just, just emanating from my body, just this incredible heat. And I could just feel the healing of the Lord just coming deep into my body, in, into my life. And, and so that went on for, the whole probably encounter maybe went on for almost three hours. And so I just had this experience, and so about quarter, to, about around midnight, I guess, the nurse came in and did her her deal, and um, you know took the vitals and all that, and then she left, and and then I just laid there really till almost four o'clock in the morning. Uh, not that I was shaking or vibrating, but I was so energized with the life of, of God. I just had so much. The life was just flowing in me, emanating from me. And so I knew he was healing. I knew, I, at first I was thinking, okay, Lord, is this it? Is this the big one? Like, we're just going to walk out of this bed and, and we're all over. Uh, and, uh, and, and, but I, I knew it was just like a significant work in my life. He, it was very real, extremely tangible, very personal. And, but, but what I, I, I want to encourage you, because I know we're stepping into a great healing revival, but I want, I want to communicate to me, when this he talks about, he's a mighty one. I like the way the New American puts it. He says he's a victorious warrior, a victorious warrior. And so I just I I feel like we're going through difficult times. We're going through you know seasons of trial and testing, but the Lord is singing over us. He is over us. He's rejoicing over us. He's delighting in you. He's intensely happy for you and wanting to bring you into a great new place. And so I I, I feel like that was just a real. Uh, landmark, a real kind of a sign, I'll say, a, 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 the real reality of God's power and His healing, not just for my life, but for the, our, our, the, our lives, the church, our nation, that God is bringing us out into a great place of deliverance. So I just love that He's exalting over us. He's delighting over us with gladness. He says, He will quiet you by His love. He will exalt over you with loud singing. So the Lord is He's spinning over us. He's dancing over us. And he, actually, there's loud singing. He's just, just rejoicing over each one of our lives. And so to me, it's a very, very powerful thing that he's doing. And so again, I mentioned just this whole, you know, this whole lockdown. And it's been, I know, so challenging for, for really everybody and really all over the world. It's been such a challenging season to walk through. And I know that there's tremendous amounts of See, prophetic words that have, have come out that there's a season of rest, it's a season of resetting, it's a season of restoration, it's a season where the Lord is, is really causing us to um, refocus on our purpose, our mission, our, and He's really has stripped away so much of our busyness, so much of our activity, so much of the things that we just kind of we do in our daily work. And again, that's not always been easy for me. I just like I'm a person who wants to move forward. I want to keep going. I want to do that. And so there's been definitely fits and <laughs> a little bit of temper, like, ah, just, you know, but I'm really yielding to what the Lord wants to do. And for me personally, it's probably been one of the, probably maybe one of the, or one of the deepest seasons of change that the Lord has, has done in my own life. There's been tremendous uh, work that the Lord's done. I've had the word in the morning when I'm spending time with the Lord in the scripture and the, and the word um, has come alive, like really no, at no other time in my life where the words are so powerful and so life-changing. And so I know the Lord through this season that we're going through of testing of trial he is working a deep work in our lives individually. I know he's, he's working uh, issues in our marriages, issues in our families, and uh, 
when all of a sudden you're spending lots and lots more time together, just stuff, just stuff just comes up. At least maybe you're way ahead of me. It comes up in me and I'm dealing with stuff. And I, I think it's probably affecting a lot of people too. And I just feel like then the Lord's doing, not just individually, marriages, family, but in the church, it is creating something, a hunger in the church. And, and I guess, first of all, within our own church, I just feel like there's, um, when you go through shared experiences, when you go through shared heart experiences, it just creates a depth of unity. It creates a, a bond in in people that it's like the foxhole mentality. You go, men go through war and they're in the foxhole together. It creates a bond that is that, that is probably the deepest uh, kind of unity you could ever have. I mean, you're, you're brothers for life. And I feel like that this experience is, the Lord's using that, first of all, to create this unity and to create this bond, but then to create a tremendous hunger and love for each other. Again, I've talked about covenant, and I'm going to talk about it some more. There, there's such a warfare right now over covenant, but I feel like the Lord's using this to deepen our love for each other, deepen covenant, deepen the unity that's in us. And and even when I when I first went to the hospital back in the end of January, I mean, it just I was amazed by just, it's like the, the church... I, used to, I think I used the expression, like, just snap to attention. Like, everybody, I mean, they just, like, Hannah and Kalani, like, they're just there for 6 o'clock in the morning for prayer. And leaders are doing things, and people are praying. And, and it's like this: the people, the church as a whole, and leadership, and the elder team, and all these people, Johnny and Isaiah, were, you know, youth and worship and all that. People were just rising. My wife, Chris, just rising to the occasion so powerfully. And so there's been this, through this season, a, a, a tremendous thrust of the church into greater dimensions of the Lord, the incredible maturity. And so I feel like that's happened within Zion, but then it's happening within our region. It's because it, we're not just walking through as our own Zion school can. All the churches are in our region and then throughout the nation and really throughout the world, the church is walking through this together. And so there's been, again, I feel like I get this idea of a shared experience it's bringing tremendous unity in the church. It's bringing this hunger for, and, and really and the, the idea that we really, how much we need each other, how much we are dependent upon each other, how much we're really, we're in this all together. We're, we're, whatever the Lord's doing, we're, you know, we're all in it together. We're all experiencing the same kind of stuff. And, and the Lord is doing a deep work in his church. He's really doing a powerful work in his church. And so then really lastly to me, it's, it's not just doing it in the church, he's doing it in the unsaved, in the world, and people who don't know Christ yet. I mean, I, I've read just the tremendous, the thousands and thousands of people who are coming to the Lord. I mean, just because of the, the, the Lord has used this to thrust the church into this online format. And so churches all over the world, that's what they're doing. And so now people who would not normally come into the building, they're, they're, they're tuning in, they're being saved by the thousands of people. I know I was looking at something with the U version of the Bible was saying the amount of access, people who are accessing their U version is just way, way, way up. I mean, it's just, there's just dramatic increase. People are scared. They're, they don't, they're looking for answers. They're, 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 you know, don't know what's going to happen with their life, with their job, their finances. And so there's a tremendous hunger. So I believe the Lord, the, obviously the, the devil brought all sickness. He brings this disease. It brings the coronavirus. But the Lord is a redeemer, and he's taking this thing, and I believe he's setting us up for a worldwide revival, that he's setting the church up for revival. He's setting into us individually up for a personal revival because we're all of a sudden have, we're spending more time focused on the Lord. He's bringing revival in our families, in our churches, and he's bringing revival in our nations, in the nations of the earth. And I believe that all of this is just a divine setup that God is going to use this to really uh, move incredibly powerful and that he's bringing us into a whole nother level of experiencing him of walking in his divine power he's going to transform the church and when we come out of this we're not going to we're not going to go back to w the way we've done church we're going to begin to walk in, th in in new ways and new uh ways in the spirit new ways in the natural practically we're, we're starting to talk about how things that we're going to carry on that are going to really impact people in, in a powerful, powerful way. So I'm really, really uh, excited about what the Lord is doing through this whole thing. It's, I know it's been difficult and challenging, but I encourage you to really, again, not, don't waste this time. I know people are, you know, you could do projects, a lot of people are doing projects, which is wonderful, it's awesome. 
but really get what the Lord wants to do in your life, in your family. Like, Lord, really get the fullness of it. Because I really feel like that, that, that thing of just being busy, he, he's really purposefully, he's, he's kind of broken that, and he really wants to do a deep work. So I encourage you just to really spend the time you need to let the Lord do what he wants to do in your life. A lot of this, and I'll try to get through this quick, is um, reminds me a lot of Exodus. And again, I, when I was in the hospital the first time, I really connected to the Exodus and really seeing the power of God, the, the, the power a God has to deliver a whole nation out of, out of a, a, a place of oppression, a place of slavery. And also his heart was to bring him into a promised land. And I really believe that there's, there's a lot of connections between the story of Exodus and where we are even right now in our nation, in, in America. And so I think one of the things that we know that the children of Israel were in, in slavery for 400 years. And then the children of Israel started to cry out. God heard their cry. He came to Moses, said, go and set my people free. Uh, Moses went to Pharaoh and said, you know, go and let my people uh, serve, serve him. And he also refused. They went through the 10 plagues. And finally, the power of Egypt was broken and the children of Israel came out of that land. But I believe that as the children of Israel were under bondage for 400 years, and I mentioned this several times in the last year, that actually this year, 2020, we're, we're going to be coming up on the 400th anniversary of the Mayflower Compact. And in 1620, when the pilgrims landed in, uh, on Plymouth Rock, and they had the Mayflower Compact that they signed on board the, the Mayflower, the ship, that we, and they basically, the compact was, we are here for the advancement, for the glory of God, for the, and the advancement of the Christian, for the, the gospel of Jesus Christ, for the advancement of the Christian religion. And they made a covenant with this land, and there were small people, they were a small group, handful of people, but they begin to establish some foundations that were set in motion that began to permeate the founding, founding, uh, founding of our nation. And again, I believe that this issue of covenant, this issue of freedom is really, the, it, it's really one of the key issues right now. And, uh, and really, um, when the Lord said, I'm gonna bring you out and I'm gonna give you the land, I'm gonna deliver you and I'm gonna give you the land, there's this aspect of the sovereignty of God God said, listen, you've been in place for 400 years, but now I'm going to redeem you. It's, it's somehow we're doing our best and advancing the kingdom of God and do, doing the work of the Lord. But there's a time when the Lord says, you know what, I'm, I'm sovereignly stepping on stage now. And I believe that we're in that season right now. I believe that this year, 2020, is a time when God has sovereignly stepped on stage and he's doing things that... Um, we just re basically respond to him. We just say, yes, Lord, and position ourselves. And we just, we kind of get in line with what, what God's doing because he's, he's, he's decided he's gonna do some very, very powerful things. And so I guess to me that the element of the sovereignty of the Lord is there in the 400 years, the covenant, the blood that they put over the doorpost, that we've been, we've been bought by the blood of Christ. And so that is all very, very powerful. Um, and so in America, I believe that we're, we're having that. I'm going to go to 2 Corinthians chapter 3. 2 Corinthians 3, verse 17. When I think about, you know, the Exodus and think about the power that God had to deliver a whole nation of slaves out of, again, the most powerful nation of the time and to bring them to the Red Sea and to part the Red Sea and to bring them through that and to really to cover their enemies. Um, and so those enemies that you see today, you will see no more was God's promise to the children of Israel. And again, I believe that we're going to not at all that I'm uh, uh, wishing anybody, any individual at all, any physical harm, but I believe that there's some things where the Lord, again, is going to sovereignly uh, do some things in our nation where he's going to establish areas of righteousness and justice in our nation in a new and fresh ways and powerful ways. So here in, th in 2 Corinthians uh, chapter 3, verse 17, it says, Now the Lord is the Spirit, and where the Spirit of the Lord is, there is freedom. He says, Now the Lord is the Spirit. So we've been praying, we have to understand, when we've been praying for revival and 
praying for the Lord to pour out his spirit upon America. We all, we want that. We want revival to come. We want people to be saved. We want, you know, transformation. We want to, to see that. But here Paul talks about, says the Lord is the spirit. So he says the Lord is the Holy Spirit. The spirit is the Lord. So when we're, when we're praying for the Holy Spirit to be poured out, we're praying for the Lordship of Christ to come into our nation. We're praying for not just that people will, the Holy Spirit will come and they'll be comforted, which we want, or they'll be healed, or they'll receive a revelation of Christ. Those are the all wonderful, fabulous things that part of the work of the Holy Spirit. But you can't, you cannot separate the Holy Spirit from the Lord. You can't, well, we just want the Holy Spirit, but we really don't want the Lord. We, you know, we just, we're not sure about the Lord. No, when we're, when we're saying, well, we want the Holy Spirit, when we want the Spirit of the Lord to come upon our land, we are asking for the Lord to come over America. We're saying, Lord, we want you to reign over our nation. We want you to be in charge. We want you to come in and, and, and be the, the ruling, reigning uh, force that's over our nation in every area of our life. And so it becomes a very powerful prayer that we need to understand that we're in this season, when as we're crying out and asking for the, for the Holy Spirit to be poured out, we're asking for the Lordship of Jesus Christ to come out over our nation. We're asking him to move in, in powerful, powerful ways. Um, and then it says, um, oh, let me, let me, let me stop there. Um, he, he goes, where the Spirit of the Lord, there, there's freedom. And, and I'm going to get, I'm going to get back into that because, uh, so we have the, the, where the Lord is, is the Spirit. And, and so where the Spirit is the Lord. And he said, um, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. And so what is the, tail tail sign of the spirit of the lord what is the mark of the holy spirit in the midst of a person's life in the midst of a family in the midst of a church or a nation what is the mark of the holy spirit it's freedom paul says here that where the spirit of the lord is there's going to be freedom so freedom is the mark and so for me it's one of my my core values it's it's one of the things that i believe in the strongest is empowering people to be free under the through the power of the holy spirit and, and under his influence and so when we talk about our nation and we talk about the Mayflower Compact and talk about our founding, foundation, foundation of our nations, I can, I'm just going to briefly just share quickly um, some of the founding documents. And so here in the Declaration of Independence, the, the writers of the Declaration said, we hold these truths to be self-evident. And this is so powerful. And you could just preach a whole message pulling this apart, that all men are created equal that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are the are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. So right from the very get-go, when our founding fathers were framing the declaration, when they're basically saying, hey, England, great, you know, King George, when, when we're declaring now, we're gonna separate from you. He said, what was the reason? Why, what, was the, what was the reason that we're gonna separate? It's because we believe in liberty. We believe in freedom, life, liberty, in the pursuit of happiness. And so that, that is woven into the very declaration of our nation is the aspect of freedom. Our, US, our Constitution, the U.S. Constitution, in the preamble of the Constitution, says, we the people of the United States, in order to form a more perfect union, establish justice in, the, in our uh, Pledge of Allegiance to our flag. We says, we, we want liberty and justice for all. And again, I think those two, those twin pillars that we, our nation has been found on and, and school children and people recite over and over, we're, we're asking, we want liberty and justice. So often, so often we want freedom, but we need to equally want justice. That, that it, our nation stands on liberty, on freedom, and on justice for all people. And that to me is really important. But when, again, the preamble, we want to establish justice, justice, ensure domestic tranquility, provide for the common defense, promote the general welfare and secure the blessings of liberty to ourselves and our posterity. Do ordain and establish the Constitution of the United States of America. Why was the Constitution ordained and established? To ensure uh, the blessings of liberty to ourselves and to our posterity, to our children, our children's children. We were here to establish liberty, to establish freedom. And so it became very, very powerful. Last one I'll say is in the Bill of Rights, the First Amendment, Again, very, very, all these founding documents are just such a powerful foundational. They're the bedrock on which our nation was founded. And so when we look at, when we're saying, Lord, 
this, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. And the Lord, and where the Spirit is, is the Lord. When we're saying that over our nation, we're saying, Lord, we want freedom. We want to establish your freedom and your righteousness and justice over our nation in a powerful way. So what we're affirming. So here in the First Amendment, Congress shall make no law respecting an establishment of religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. So there's freedom of religion and freedom from religion. That was our first, very first uh, amendment to, in, the, in the Bill of Rights. Or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. Or abridging the freedom of speech or the freedom of the press, or the right of people to peacefully to assemble and to petition the government for a redress of grievances. These are incredible freedoms that um, are incredibly relevant right now. And so there's really, as you probably are all aware, a real battle that's raging uh, all over our nation. And I know when we hit this whole first initial coronavirus, there's really pretty great unanimity between what people were embracing and what people were saying that, you know, we all need to stay home, we need to do that. And honestly, I feel like I, I believe that that was the right thing to do. And again, I'm not here to argue one side or the other. That's not my point today. That there, but there's great unanimity in that, in that. And so, and for whatever reasons, at this point, obviously there's a lot of fracturing. There's a lot of kind of experts on both sides and a lot of debate and a lot of uh, turmoil that's happening within our nation. And so really, to me, the, there's this issue of freedom of control. And again, I'm not here to say wh which side's right or to endorse one side or the other. Um, but I'm, I'm here t for us as, in, as believers and as a church at, as, and in our nation to embrace the idea that we need to establish freedom is foundational to our nation, is foundational to our lives. It's, it's the bedrock on which we are formed, and it only comes out of the Spirit of the Lord. It really only comes out of revival. I can't remember which of the Founding Fathers said that, and might even be Ben Franklin, that our nation is, is wholly inadequate to be governed by anybody but a religious people, a people who, are, are the God, uh, who follow the God of the Bible. And so there's this tremendous um, debate that's raging right now, uh, you know, freedom versus control. How much control does the, the, the state have and how much is it impinging on constitutional right? And now all of a sudden on, you know, on Facebook and on many other articles, there's people are turning to the Constitution, they're talking about the Bill of Rights, they're talking about the First Amendment. And it's obviously, again, I believe the Lord is using that to get us back to our foundation, to establish in our, our hearts and in our lives that we're actually moving through this season where we're going to re-embrace some of the foundational principles again how that works out in government and decisions that are made that you know we'll, we'll just have to work through that and, and 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 kind of walk through that and see what happens and again we have the we have the freedom to assemble we have the freedom of speech we have the freedom to redress our grievances through the court system we have incredible freedoms to 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 petition our government in a peaceful honorable godly way in a biblical way and so we are blessed with incredible, we don't have to have any kind of crazy armed insurrection, like you know, we're not some ruling by some, you know, despot dictator in our nation. We have the ability to, in a godly way, really, again, petition, and people may, will feel differently about the issue, and that's great, but we, we have an ability to walk out, but I feel like the Lord is doing that. But then my, my, my question, and kind of how I want to look forward is, at this point, you know, we're dealing with this coronavirus, and However, you know, you may peg the, obviously it's a very, very serious, hundreds of thousands of people have died. It's a very serious issue. It's, you know, people are doing their best, huge medical response. People are sacrificing to respond well to that. So we applaud all that, the sacrifice, the difficulty that they're all walk, walking through and that, what they're giving that for. But again, I, I, and so within this issue though of the coronavirus, that there's a, now this debate that's rising, is particularly within our state, how much authority does the governor have, how Governor Inslee have, and what, you know, the church and, and people, this is the right to work. And, and again, this, this debate is raging, but I, I wanna push the, the issue just a little bit and just more to make you aware, to get, to get you to think about, at this point, the, let's say the death rate is under 1%. If we knew exactly how many people were infected, and probably it'd be a really, really large number. The percent of people who are actually dying, whether it's 1% or under 1% or whatever, it's somewhat irrelevant. But I wanna go on into, the, to, to me, the, the issue is, again, freedom versus control and us embracing freedom. 
because I, I, I want us to think about this issue, is what happens because our governor, for him, he's really, uh, for him, climate change is an extremely big issue. And so if we have a health issue, coronavirus, which is an extremely you know, important health issue, and that is eliciting the response of government over our lives, what happens when all of a sudden, and, and you have maybe to say it's a 1% fatality rate, but all of a sudden you believe that, that climate change could actually wipe our planet out. Like we could have a 100% death rate. Where, what, what kind of actions or what kinds of, again, I'm just getting you to think today. I'm, I'm just putting thoughts out there. And I'm, I'm just get, let, dropping thoughts. And I want you to just start to think about, because we're all going to have to wrestle with freedom. And what does freedom mean for my life? But if, if the government can say, hey, climate change is going to wipe our planet out, what, how far does that go? And again, I'm just throwing that out. I'm going to throw out another really difficult one. The whole area of sex education in, our, in our, our, our school system, which is the governor signed into law. I don't think they're going to teach it this next fall. I think it's for the, the, the year after. But here we have a, a sex education curriculum that's basically been developed, from what I understand, by Planned Parenthood. It is, it is insane. It's immoral. It's ungodly. It's causing, you know, talking about grade school children, talking about whether they're a male or a boy or girl, male or female. Um, going into all kinds of sexual impurity, Im immorality. And so it's a health issue though. And so, and, and this, is not, this is not that far off. In Canada, the law is, if a, one of the, a ch you have a child in your home and your child starts to have con questions and thoughts about whether they're a boy or girl, that mom or dad cannot begin to persuade them one way or the other, or they can be thrown in jail. And if somebody, uh, if I'm wrong, please correct me. But that, from what I've read, uh, uh, is, is the law that's in Canada right now. So, freedom. Freedom versus control. We need the Spirit of the Lord. Our Lord is a victorious warrior. He's over the situation. He is laughing. He is rejoicing. He's not over the darkness, not over people's sickness. He's not a laughing over that. But he is he's, 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 he's above all of this. And what, what I'm feeling is, is church, we need to step into, it's imperative for us to step into the fullness of time. This is a full season. We have to embrace the work of the Lord. We have to embrace the work that God's doing. We have to embrace the spirit of the Lord because it's going to bring freedom to my life. It's going to bring freedom to my family, to my church, to my community. And so that we really, this issue of freedom, it's not going to be fought through flesh and blood. I believe that there can be some natural walking steps of walking. I was so proud of Cindy DeWitt when Cindy just recently, she felt the Lord said, hey, I want you to take one of the petitions that will, that will be a, to get on the ballot to overturn the sex, ed sex education law. And Cindy responded to the spirit of the Lord and is beginning to gather signatures to help that process. That is a godly response. It's a, it's a lawful response. It's a freedom and a right and a privilege that we have to begin to petition our government to establish righteous laws. And so to me, we, got, we have to begin to think about, we, we cannot just stay within our four walls. We have to begin to think, how can I engage? And it's not just politics. It's not just government. It's in economics. There's, you get into the tremendous degree of control that's really raging between China and America right now, economically, technologically, um, technology rights. There's a tremendous battle that's raging in that arena right now. So it's, it's embracing really every area of life. And church, we are called to, to move into every, each of these seven mountains. We're called to, to walk and to move into every issue. Um, so there's, um, we're called to, how do I put this? This is, I'm really glad that Jesus did not practice social distancing. And I say that on purpose, and I say that strongly. Jesus was not afraid to touch the leper. And I don't do that to condemn anybody. I don't condemn, I've been, I've, obviously I've been practicing it myself. We're all practicing social distancing, because why? We're afraid of getting sick, we're afraid of dying. And so I'm, I'm not, there's no condemnation, there's no guilt trip, there's no shame. But Jesus has called us as the church to be free from the fear of sickness. He's called us to be free from the fear of death. And so again, 
this touches every area of our life. It touches our health. It touches our society. And so I believe one of the things that the Lord's calling us to do is to, be, to, be, to walk in freedom. Jesus obviously was not afraid to, to, to reach out and touch the leper. That was their, that was their corona, coronavirus of that day. They, you know, if they touched the lepers, they were going to get it and they were going to die. Church, we, we can do that. John G. Lake, a man well, probably 100 plus years ahead of his time, he, he was in the midst of a, of a uh, pandemic, of worse, of a uh, disease that was, was killing people by the thousands. And you've read the stories about how he put, they put the virus in his hands and it dissolved. That's there. There's, there's the history of the church. There's been people who, the Christian believers, who've walked into the middle of things. I'm, again, I'm not saying this to condemn anybody. I'm just challenging us. I'm challenging myself. We need to walk in the life and the power and the freedom of Christ so that we can walk into areas where people are sick and we know we've got the stuff. We have freedom over disease. We have the power and authority to walk in that area. And so again, I'm just challenging us in all these different areas that we can walk into that. I believe that we need to be free from the fear of man. There's a tremendous harvest that's out there. Church, we need to get, you know, I, we need to get, I need to, we all need to get such a power of the Holy Spirit. They're going to be free of the fear of man. And we're going to preach the word of God with boldness. There's a harvest to be brought in and that's going to happen out there. It's, it's going to maybe, it's going to happen maybe through um, some people watching online, but the great majority of it's going to happen one-on-one -on -one with you and me out there demonstrating the power and the love of Christ and the power that he wants of meeting people in practical situations. And so the, God, the love of Christ is going to be uh, uh, met in powerful ways. Steve and Christine Danville are meeting people in powerful ways, practically demonstrating the love of God out through, through there in a powerful way. So we're being thrust out into the, into the world. Let me just say this, that when each time that we obey the Holy Spirit, we release the Lordship of Jesus Christ over our nation. So however small it may be, every time you obey the impulse to talk to somebody, to pray for somebody, to give somebody a meal or something simple, anytime you do that, whenever, again, where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom. The Lord is, is the Spirit. So every time, I'm challenging us, every time we obey the impulse of the Holy Spirit, we're releasing the Lordship of Jesus Christ over our nation. We're causing that title. I believe that, what, again, what we've had is there's this been this pullback that we've talked about, the tidal wave. There's been this pullback, and we're seeing all this stuff that's being exposed in our lives, in our families, in our churches, in our nation, and it's all being there because there's a tidal wave of change that's coming into our nation. And again, it's going to be released through the obedience that we have to the Holy Spirit. It's going to be that. I'm going to give you one last scripture. And then we'll be done. James chapter 1, verse 12. James 1, 12. Again, I believe that 2020 is a hinge year. It's a hinge decade. We're, we're going to see incredible thrusting of the church out into the harvest, out into signs and wonders and miracles. We're going to see healing revival. But James chapter 1, verse 12 says, Blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. We're, on, we're under trial right now. It's... Um, Comparatively, I was, I was reading to sharing with the peak on a, a Tuesday morning. Just we had a Zoom call uh, talking about Paul, and, and I think it's Second Corinthians chapter twelve, and Paul begins to list out all the, the things that he suffered, being uh, five times uh, lashed, thirty nine lashes, and uh, describes his suffering. So yeah, I'm I'm a little annoyed and I'm a little discomforted. But I'm not, I'm not suffering like Paul. But we are under trial. We are under a lot of stress. And obviously, tremendous economic stress for those who are out of work. Uh, tremendous out of stre uh, uh, economic stress. And again, we want to encourage you, if you need help, to get hold of our church website, to get hold of the you know, leadership in our church. And to, we want to be there for you. If it's food, if it's whatever, rent, whatever your needs are, we want to meet the practice. So again, not to minimize, there's tremendous trial and testing that's going out. But anyway, blessed is the man who remains steadfast under trial. For when he has stood the test, he will receive the crown of life, which God has promised to those who love him. When we've been steadfast and we've, we've basically passed the test, when we've stood the test, he will receive the crown of life. We probably all know this corona means crown. The devil has come to crown us with death. He meant to, 
to kill millions and millions of people throughout the planet. Jesus has come as we, we persevere through this trial he, and we remain steadfast through this trial. We're going to be crowned with life. Jesus is going to crown you individually. He's going to crown the church. It's going to be a crown of authority. We're going to, the crown means we're going to rule and reign in Christ. Talking about rule and reign, that he is going to crown us with life. And so again, I want us to encourage you, as we persevere and as we're steadfast through this trial, the Lord is going to crown us with life. The end result, we're going to begin to walk. And in Romans 8, we're going to begin to walk in the freedom of the glory of the sons of God. God's called us to freedom. He's called us to liberty, free from death, free from sickness, free from the fear of man, free from all the sin that wants to, to weigh on us. He's going to cause, he's causing the church to walk in great freedom. And the end result is, is we are going to be crowned with life. And so I just want to release that crown, that, that ability, well, first of all, that ability to endure. And again, I'm, I'm preaching to myself today to be steadfast, to endure, to be steady under trial, to, again, not, not flake out, not get into the flesh, not respond out of the flesh. Again, there's leaders who are trying to make some really hard decisions, so we need to, again, continue to pray for them, continue to do our best. Again, I you know, encourage you to, whatever the Lord tells you, what, to walk it out. We, we've been given tremendous freedoms to respond in a godly, peaceable way to our government and to every situation. So just stay in the, in the spirit of the Lord. Walk in the spirit of the Lord. Walk in freedom and be steadfast. And the end result is we're going to be crowned with life. So Lord, today I just release the grace and the power and the life of Christ to crown us with power, to endue us with power, Lord, to walk in the fullness. And Lord, I just pray that every person that's here today, listening today, would begin to, to, to would begin, but to really, that you would complete the work that you want to do in their life during this season, that there would be not one person who would fully get that completed work. And when we get that glorious day, when we get together and we get to hopefully hug each everybody and we get to just uh, be together and to embrace and experience our time together, that Lord, you're gonna, there's going to be a, a, a level of explosion, a level of the depth of community, of loving each other, of experiencing the covenant that we have with each other that's going to release a powerful, powerful revival, not just in our church, but churches all over America and all over the world. So God bless you. Thank you so much again for being in my home. It's a great privilege and delight for me to have you share this time. And God bless you all. Love you so much.